Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Here we are again. Great fortune, lovely opportunity to be together. Thanks so much for joining in. And thank you all for joining in. I thank myself for joining in. It's really good. This is good. We've come here to celebrate the Dharma, to activate the Dharma in our own minds and hearts right now. So we put this time aside to kind of let that preciousness sizzle and open up and kind of inform and all of our experience, this kind of lived present moment. So as we always do, we kind of really reactivate that, this connection to Dharma, the connection to our own goodness, the goodness of others, in these three ways we reactivate that. With renunciation, or joy and appreciation, and then secondly with bodhicitta, and thirdly with pure perception. And so the first, we'll kind of really turn on our gratitude, and just kind of relax in one way, just we, we are wonderful we have this goodness to just kind of be with that. Let that goodness just kind of be there and just relax and settle, take a deep breath and just kind of get to enjoy the being in the presence of your goodness. <laughs> Let it just kind of come on, turn on, and like really kind of shine out and appreciate all these amazing fortunate circumstances we have. So kind of activate this joy and appreciation, of connect to that goodness inside. And then secondly, with bodhicitta, we're connecting to the goodness in others, too. That they're so precious. That all these beings have been our parents. or like our only children. So many times in so many varieties of situations. And even if we don't believe that, that these beings, they don't want to suffer and they want to be happy. All of them, every single being we come across, all the days and years go by, every single person or being or animal we've ever come across, that's all they want is to be happy just like me, just like each of us. And so we're doing this practice so that this can be a genuine benefit for others, that we can wake up and connect to our inherent good goodness and have that shine out and just encourage and uplift and support and nourish all beings we come in contact with until they're totally free, until their goodness shines on forever. So this bodhicitta, we turn this on. And then the pure perception or our Vajra nature, Vajra pride, kind of seeing the, that goodness in, in ourselves and in others, and in one way kind of relaxing also our sense doors a little bit, not so tight, not so boxed in, and kind of really to let it kind of, uh, let that awareness, that kindness, that creative kind of distilled intelligence, to let it kind of really blaze and shine out that this isn't so much as a, some kind of a horror show or some wheel of suffering we have to escape, but more like this is something to really enjoy and savor, this experience we have right now, this moment, like the colors we're seeing, the sounds we're hearing, that if we like pause and kind of allow it to be a recognition of like, wow, how amazing this is. These colors and sounds, these tastes and memories, these emotions, like just the richness of it all. So in a very kind of like we could say in a really kind of approachable way, just that richness of life. In my own direct experience right now, that can in some way be like this pure perception. So we'll kind of turn on these three qualities in our own experience right now. Wonderful. Thank you. So the topic today is called Releasing Buddhist Guilt. Releasing Buddhist Guilt. And so that's kind of more just like a, you know, a title, uh, a way to kind of designate what we're looking at. Um, and this comes up in response to kind of different questions we've gotten from Nundro in terms of specifically um, the idea of like we're surrounded with all these amazing techniques and opportunities, these prayers, like calling the Lama from afar prayer by His Holiness Dujan Rinpoche, that's right at the beginning of this nundro. Sometimes that 
that what, like sometimes it's just so amazing, these Vajra songs, these descriptions of how enlightened beings are and what they see. Sometimes it's just so extraordinary that it actually can make us feel bad. Like, wow, another reason that I'm not really there yet. Like I read the prayer and it doesn't really kind of turn alive in my own heart and mind. And it kind of can do this kind of turn where it actually makes me have like a little bit of a distance from it. As if like I'm outside of that. And so this kind of heaviness can come. And this is just such a human thing. And I have so much sympathy for this. And so I'm just thinking about that and contemplating it in my experience. And I surely have a lot of feelings of just, you know, trying to activate this uh, joy and appreciation in bodhicitta and um, vajra pride. This, this is the path, right? I mean, if it was already easy and could just turn on, then we'd all be there and done. There'd be no path. We would be free. But so we have a little distance from this. I mean, each of us do. We're sentient beings. So it becomes this really practical Dharma question of like, how can I, you know, use these tools and techniques, these descriptions and stories, all these practices, how can I use them to relieve my burden, to relieve my suffering, and not just become another way to feel bad or to feel guilty? And here I'm not saying guilty in like some kind of technical term, okay? So I'm not a therapist, and this isn't therapy. I think it's really good to just say that clearly. I don't have any professional expertise in terms of this deep emotional work. I really have a lot of respect for the, all the different kinds of therapeutic modalities there are for mind and body. It's just such an amazing, to be so caring, to have taken the time to, to really learn different ways that the mind and the body function um, to help one another, ourselves and others, to attune, to heal, to find relief, to find happiness. I have so much uh, honor for, like, really respect for that, people who do that. But this is kind of more along the lines of, specifically, of, like, Buddha Dharma. So talking about this topic of kind of releasing Buddhist guilt. So, like, this sense of heaviness we can have, even it's not so much like technically Buddhist guilt, but it's more like just a sentient being, just kind of feeling bad, like bummed out and like heavier by, oh, I'm not good enough. And then I'm, I identify as a Buddhist. And so then it's like, I'm a Buddhist and I have all these things I know I should do, could do these steps I could take. And if I don't take them, then it can make me feel worse. So what to do about that? So that's kind of the topic for this Nundro. And I think it's just a really real human thing I mean, I think all, a lot of these topics and discussions is not trying to be like some, uh, like a nice saucy kind of new catchy title or something. This is genuinely, I've, myself and others that I've um, been in touch with for years, this is a real issue. It's a real challenge. This, and especially in contemporary culture, where there's so much about kind of low self-esteem and lack of self-worth a lack of kind of connectedness, of feeling a part of something, of having a defined purpose. These are in one ways like kind of a, another like layer of pandemic of our time. And not to diagnose this, this problem really specifically or with too much time, but contemporary culture, it is kind of more about what we have. It's kind of a tangible degenerate time, right? We have to demonstrate our worth by proving something, producing something, consuming something what we have, to show it, you know, it's very tangible. And it's not so much about who we are, our being quality, the presence we bring, our ability to bear witness, the creative energy that we hold and engage something with, the love that we like gen generate, just simply, like a simple moment of kindness is so deep and profound but we happen to be in kind of a lot of contemporary cultures in general, speaking generally, that these kind of more quiet features, sometimes you, we just call them emotions. <laughs> the emotions kind of get overlooked a little. And it's just what we do and how much we have and how big our bank account is and all that. So not to diagnose it too much, but it's just to say this is a problem, it's a challenge. This is a big challenge. So how do we have our Dharma practice not become one more reason of why I suck, you know? 
How do we use it to inspire ourselves? Sometimes Kempo Selman Rinpoche, he talks about getting out of the ditch. How can we get out of this specific ditch to find our inherent goodness and worth, our value? So this is a gigantic topic, and it's, but it's worth, really, it's worth kind of looking at a little bit, even to just publicly talk about it, that we have this experience of the path can actually you know, feel like too much, too hard. Where could I even start? So alignment's so far away. How could I ever get there? All save all beings, help all beings? How is that even possible? You know, this can become like a way that we actually prevent ourselves from connecting to the Dharma, from connecting to our own goodness. So in the end, I mean, kind of more speaking from more of the result of the path, like that's all that, that we're trying to do is recognize that goodness in ourselves and others. Right? They say all the Buddha's teachings are about revealing that inherent goodness and removing what's temporarily blocking it. That that's what a Buddha is. A Buddha is one who completely removed all the temporary obscurations, the cognitive and emotional obscurations. They removed everything that was temporary, that was distracting, that was destabilizing from the true nature, that was adventitious or just temporary. They removed the stains. And then after removing the stains, what did that happen? They revealed that inherent goodness in themselves and in others, in all phenomena. That everything is inherently good. We have this inherent goodness. And so one way, this some, to some degree, like dealing with that, a sense of this kind of heaviness or kind of when we lock up in response to the beauty of something, the beauty of a prayer, the beauty of an opportunity, the magnificence of a practice or of a visualization. Like sometimes we, we really need to use healthy habits like good conceptualization or a reframing. And part of reframing really is even just the belief, that idea, I am good. You are good. We have this Buddha nature. This is what's essential. And all the things covering that up, they're temporary. Their stains, they are removable. These mistakes we've made, the activities we do that are unhealthy or harmful, these are temporary mistakes. They are not essential. They are not who we are. And in Buddhism, it's very clear about this point. We are not inherently bad. We're inherently good. Every single being. And then Buddhism in Mount Mahayana magnifies that. The very fabric, the empty, open, dynamic fabric of all reality is sparkling with love and compassion and wisdom. It's just woven in. It's like what, when the mind recognizes emptiness, it just turns on brightly as love and compassion and power. Skillful means. This is conceptually and experientially, this is the fabric bedrock essential teaching of the Buddha. We are all good. And so that's just a conceptual framing. And we can read those teachings on Buddha nature. And we can read teachings like on the 18 endowments. What are, what are we like so fortunate to not be under the, like limited by? We're not hell beings, we're not pretas. There's this list of 18 endowments. Not only what do we avoid that's bad, what do we have that's wonderful? And we should conceptually really touch that, like really look into that. Like in His Holiness Dujan Rinpoche, in his book, a Torch Lighting the Way to Freedom, this commentary on the Dujan Chersar Nundro, Torch Lighting the Way to Freedom, it's so beautiful. This table of contents, he goes through each of these 18 endowments, and it's just so lovely to even reconnect with that a little bit. Just a little. And if, it, if it's too much, or if it like becomes a long list, then we need to just kind of pace ourselves. We need to know our own minds a little bit. What helps my mind open up? You know, if a whole list of 18 things doesn't do it, and I just need one, one simple thing, then use the one simple thing. We don't have to open a door in 84,000 ways. We just have to open the door once. We need to connect to the, the medicine or the dharma the specific technique or the turning of the mind, the like kind of attunement, the one that helps my mind right now open up. We only need the one. 
We don't need all of them. So we have to like clearly look in our minds and see what is it that my mind is kind of like holding in an unrealistic way, and then what's the way to kind of release that holding. And I will read just because this is inspiring. Also, when His Holiness Dujan Rinpoche, his book Counsels from My Heart. <clears throat> Of all the 84,000 sections of the Buddha's teachings, none is more profound than bodhicitta. Make every effort on the path, uniting absolute and relative bodhicitta. This distills the essence of all the sutras and the tantras. The subduing of one's own mind is the root of dharma. When the mind is controlled, defilements naturally subside. Again, this is just a, these are concepts that we hear. And the path is to like directly taste this for ourselves, to experience it, to put it into practice and to transform how our mind is, how our heart is, which means just to connect with that goodness, to reveal that inherent dignity that we all have, the Buddha nature. But if too much complex co complications, if it doesn't help us, then distill it into bodhicitta. And if we need that, if that's too simple, then we can get more complex. Zoom into bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta, and absolute bodhicitta. And what's a relative bodhicitta? Aspiring bodhicitta, an engaging bodhicitta. As aspirations, even if we're in a really dark place and we're stuck, we can wish and pray to, to we can aspire. That one day we'll be able to like totally mingle our minds with the Dharma. One day may I really be a boat, a bridge an island, the medicine, like for all the beings wandering in samsara, the ocean of samsara, we can make that aspiration. That's something that we can just turn our mind a little bit. It's so simple, but so profound. It really changes everything to kind of have a little aspiration prayer. So if there's certain aspiration prayers you know, then like write down a little aspiration prayer and every now and then kind of r remind yourself of that. And Lama Chime, he would write line, Dharma lines and then kind of paste them around his practice area to kind of tune in. He had, they said, on his puja table in Mandarava House in Florida, he had all these watches. <laughs> impermanent. We need to use these conceptual reminders to reactivate our experience or to reinvigorate our practice. We should use these conceptual reminders, but they all come down to like actually tasting it for ourselves. It's one thing to hear about the Buddha nature or that Vajra pride, to hear about it. And that is really important to turn our minds to that possibility. Because if we're not aware of a possibility, it's really hard to consciously undergo a process to awaken that possibility or to actualize the possibility. We do need to frame in a certain way and use concepts that are healthy and helpful for us. But in the end, it's about actually the transformation. So what are the steps of actually awakening that dignity, that competence, the courage in my experience? Where then the Dharma, like, wow, the kind of amazing stories and it's like everything can be inspiring and uplifting. And the challenges can be much more of a like opportunity to purify or an opportunity to help. Or an opportunity to surrender to the goodness, to the Dharma, to the natural flow of cause and effect. So that's, we need to actually kind of transform. That's what it's leading to. So they say practice, right? We use study and practice. And we need to balance these two. In Pali, it's pariyati and patipati. Patipati, we study. This is so valuable to memorize texts, to write out Dharma teachings of the Buddha. There's so much merit and good, positive, virtuous energy that we can generate doing things like this. And so much about the path is just to generate virtue, is to become disciplined in being virtuous, to have a, a longing to be helpful, to be a, value, a valuable service, to like have that goodness come out, to have like this longing to care for others. And then in the practical application of that, this is like in this book, this new book by Patra Krimache, Awakening Dignity. Awakening Dignity by Patra Krimache. This specifically is going over this specific topic of how to awaken dignity, of how to actually, what are the steps we do to come out of this kind of closed mindedness or like shut down experience, this tension we have that's not natural, but how do we release it? How do we awaken it? And he has a, a few lines in here that are really, or so many lines are really helpful and I've only just started looking at this, but he said, 
Compassion is how we begin. Wisdom is how we grow. And dignity is how we are. I thought that was so profound. Compassion is where we begin. Wisdom is how we grow. Dignity is how we are. So how we begin, how we grow, and how we are. We can begin with compassion. So if it's hard to have compassion for oneself, self-love, self-care, I know in contemporary times this seems like it's a lot harder to do than to care for someone else. So if it's easier to care for someone else, there's so many opportunities for that in really small ways. And we can start with quiet, subtle, imperceptible ways like aspiring bodhicitta, like reciting Four Boundless. Take, an extra, take some extra time to just recite Four Boundless, just slowly. And say one and then pause. May all beings have happiness in the cause of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering in the cause of suffering. May all beings never be dissociated from the supreme happiness which is without suffering. May all beings remain in boundless equanimity, free from both attachment to close ones and rejection of others. Of all the world, of, like throughout the whole world, of all the words said today, one time, at least, the four boundless was recited. It actually, reality, let that happen. That's such a big view. All beings have happiness. I always love it when Kempo Samuel Doni Rinpoche talks about the four boundless because he always gets so gushy. <laughs> and gushy and like he like sizzles and like kind of sparks on and because it's the Dharma. It's like the heart of the Dharma. It's the heart of bodhicitta, this aspiring bodhicitta. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. It's so simple to say this and just let your mind be with that, even the sound of it. Just the idea of like that it, it happened in this space, that such a thought, like that such an aspiration was made. It becomes a noble space. It becomes like a sacred place that such profound dharma was said. And you said it. I said it. And I'm just repeating something, but it connects directly to the nature. Then in addition, do Tonglen. Oh, awaken that, really that kind of passionate compassion care for all beings to love them so viscerally like they're your only child children then i want to help them activate that kind of sense of like really kind of leaning in responsibility that courageous leaning in i'll take on their suffering i'll give them my happiness just as if it was my own baby who was sick or if it was like a wounded animal in front you know, sometimes it's a little baby, it's so easy to love, and sometimes it's someone who's really writhing in a lot of pain and is like lashing out. It's like a wounded animal who can't help but try to bite someone if they go to help them. We can use Tonglen, practice like Tonglen. We can just do it quietly. We don't have to tell anyone. We don't have to change our posture. It's all about kind of our mind and opening and our heart opening. And what is that? Connecting to that fundamental dignity, that goodness we have. That's all the teachings are going towards revealing that fundamental goodness and removing what is obscuring it or blocking it, shutting it down. So these doubts that we have as a human realm being, doubt and hesitation are the big stumbling blocks. These doubts I have about myself and about the Dharma and about cause and effect and about all these things. Yes, there's a doubt that leads us towards the nature and then there's doubt that leads us away from the nature. Venerable Kempo Rinpoche's have been really clear about this. The doubt that leads us toward the nature activates our compassion, activates our wisdom, activates our dignity, that inherent goodness or that power, the skillful versatility of the creative kind of mind. Healthy doubt awakens those qualities, so we're getting closer to our natural state of being. Unhealthy doubt blocks us from that sparkling energy of our own in inherent goodness. So we can discern. Is this doubt making me more tense, more reactive, more closed-minded, more prideful? Or is it making me more at ease, more connected, more enlivened, more enthusiastic? So we need to be clear about which is happening in our experience. And we need to really have this discernment.
when a technique is really like helping me connect to my goodness. And so many of the kind of easy avenue, the easy, little easier access ones are, are rooted in compassion. A genuine care for others. And we can start small. We can start with more of a meta, where we love just one person who's easy to, to love, someone in our lives who we're really close with. We can expand that to include more beings we love. We can expand that to include ourselves, our family. And we can gradually kind of grow these muscles or like open these capacities that we have to connect to our goodness. And little by little, they'll, they'll grow. Like the great Shantideva said, that's the quality of a habit. The more we do it, the easier it becomes. Then we have to discern whether it's a good habit, and so it's helping us on the path, or it's a bad habit, and it's blocking our way on the path. And that's up to our own discernment and like following kind of the guidance of our teachers and of course the great Buddha Shakyamuni and Guru Rinpoche, we have so many kind of avenues of helping us line up with what actually, to make healthy decisions, kind of have a more wise discernment. So there's really a lot of things to say about this, but I, one thing is this that helped me too also in this book, Awakening Dignity, I thought in my mind, Vajrasapha practice, we all know. This is really the big purification practice in Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhist uh, kind of worldview. That to connect with Buddha Vajrasattva. And how do we connect with Buddha Vajrasattva? With the four powers. The four powers. And what was helpful in this book is um, Patrick Rinpoche, he called them the four healing powers. And it really changed, changed something in my mind. The four healing powers. Oh, okay. Hmm. This is so curious. Because in a, so this is like to take a little bit of a sidestep, but the sutra approach in general in terms of the Buddha's teachings, it kind of posits something's broken and we have to fix it. Something's wrong, like there's a burning house or I got shot with an arrow or like there's this ocean of suffering or a pit of vipers or my hair's on fire, like there's a problem and I need to remedy the problem. So in that way of holding these kind of situations of life in the kind of in the sutra mode, which is if I'm in that mode, then I need a sutra response to that mode and all the responses are therapeutic. The Dharma is talked about as a medicine there's some kind of a healing that needs to happen. There's some kind of a realignment, a correction, a purification, right? So this is all kind of in the sutra language of like when my, when my mind believes something's broken, something's wrong, something is not okay, and it needs to be changed somehow, transformed, purified, distanced, get space, that's sutra mode which is so important because my mind is like that all the time. Something's wrong, what do I do? Suffering causes suffering. The Tantra mode isn't in a therapeutic modality. It says it's all good. There's nothing wrong. There's no samsara, there's no nirvana. These are just conceptual designations we're holding on to because we're just not seeing clearly what actually is happening. So they don't talk about a problem and its remedy or like kind of a challenge in our response. They talk about directly connecting to a way of seeing and being that doesn't have this mistaken way of holding, of creating a problem that wasn't there. It's called a tantric mode. But here, the four healing supports. Then it kind of has both of this. In my mind, it was like, oh, okay, Vajrasattva, Buddha of compassion, Buddha of purification. Because sometimes you're like, oh, I have all this bad stuff I need to purify. You know, again, I'm so bad. I have all this bad stuff and I need to get rid of it. So it kind of locks into that similar I'm so bad thing. And I need to use this Buddha to do it. But it's like more of a healing. It's like I'm worth it. Like I have the value to do this. Like I have this goodness there. But I need the support to help reveal this goodness. And it, to have the courage to recognize there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with the situation. If I'm not, if I don't have that courageous view, that's why I do Vajrasapa practice. So what are these four healing supports? One is to have remorse, and that's a very clear discernment. 
to clearly see all oh, this thing I did, the thing I said, that response I did, the grimace I said, the kind of bad fumbling words or like kind of the emotional upheaval I, I kind of like shot out there into the world. Oh, that was not so, it wasn't good. It was harmful. I feel bad about that. That discernment of recognizing a negative emotion as a negative emotion, a destructive emotion as a destructive emotion, as something that's dis disharmonious or like that closes us from our, our natural goodness, that's a lot of wisdom there to recognize that. And we need that wisdom to be able to discern healthy habit from unhealthy habit. So this has, is talked about as remorse, the first healing support, is to recognize something negative as being negative and to feel bad about it. Oh, I don't wanna, this is all this anger happening in me. All of a sudden the anger isn't me, it's something that was happening in me or that I expressed. So there's a little distance there. And I don't wanna be, I don't wanna have this anger kind of take me over all the time. That recognition that I'm not angry, I'm not anger, something I just experienced temporarily. There's a lot of wisdom there. And then I feel bad about this. I don't, I'm not, I'm not an angry person. I don't want to be an angry person. I don't want to just constantly like put fires everywhere. I'm talking about destructive anger, right? Not constructive, you know, healthy kind of tough love. I'm talking about like kind of really harmful anger. But so this remorse is seeing a negativity and wanting to like not keep doing it. And then we need support. That's the second healing support. Actual have support. Well, I need help to not do that again. So there's an external support and an internal one. In this case of Vajrasapha practice, the external support is Buddha Vajrasapha, who is like the total embodiment of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and of your own personal teacher. is the essential goodness quasi all the qualities of the awakened ones, Arhats and Bodhisattvas and Buddhas. So this is kind of the more Vajrayana or the Buddhist support. It's the venerable, sublime, noble support. But then there's also other external supports we can use, like good trustworthy friends or good professional like specialists who, we can, who, who have a real genuine ability and intention to help us. They can help us correct, like, oh, we have remorse about something we did wrong. We can depend on their advice. We can actually go to them and confide. Oh, this, didn't, this wasn't, you know, in a trustful kind of safe situation. Oh, not, don't feel so good about doing this or thinking this way or doing that. And that we can rely on their support. What are they helping us point towards? The inner support. The inner support is our inherent goodness, our inherent intelligence, compassion, and wisdom. They're helping us direct, direct us to see that in ourselves. They're not saying you need to rely on me forever. They're pointing us to see ourselves more clearly, to come from that place in ourselves, that Buddha nature. That, that has that wisdom and that compassion and that love. So in the end, that's the internal support. That's kind of where all this is going towards, all these teachings. And then the third healing support is the antidote. One way, if there's a negativity that we did, we can like have an antidote of like doing the opposite, the positive. Kind of, it's a counteractive measure. Measure. If we were kind of really overwhelmed by anger, then we can like try to intentionally cultivate patience. Patience is just a willingness to be with reality as it's happening, and to not wish it changed somehow. And that's really so much easier to say than do. But we can cultivate that. There's paramita practices of patience. The Buddha taught so many systematic ways, taking step by step on how to cultivate of such a quality as patience, or all the other paramitas as well. That's an antidote. We can also receive the blessing wisdom nectar of Vajrasapha as an antidote to instantly relieve and release all of our negativity, all of our attachment, all of our distorted perceptions, all of the certain wrongdoings and tendencies towards, towards them. That's an antidote. And then fourthly, the fourth healing support is the conviction or the commitment to really not want to repeat that mistake or that negativity, that kind of tension or like closed-mindedness, to not want to repeat it. So we kind of make a firm commitment. And even though as human beings, then we think, oh, well, I might do that again. But little by little, if we really try to have that firm resolve again and again, it becomes stronger over time. 
and we actually don't want to do it anymore. And then we start doing it less. And eventually, that we actually, it just becomes something we can just drop. So it's little by little, little by little. So that's also kind of part of connecting to this goodness and not being overwhelmed by having Dharma kind of be experiences like a burden, another thing we have to do, another kind of job, you know? Little by little, this is drop by drop. And part of that is, is like a, a regularity. And again, I think Patra Purpache in this book, Awakening Dignity, talks about regularity towards the very end of this book. In 217, both training and practice require that we shift our focus from thinking about our ordinary worries and difficulties to understanding the mind and its nature. Doing so on a daily basis enhances our experience of dignity. The key is maintaining steady, consistent effort without grasping at the result. The goal is to neither be dejected by poor practice or elated by strong practice. Then we become our own master and not the victim of others' opinions or of our own fleeting emotions. At that point, the effect of our meditation will show in our daily life. We will be more content and at ease, and our qualities of compassion and love will shine naturally. This is the sign we're improving and that our meditation experience, behavior, and view are in harmony. So here the point I thought to highlight was this daily basis. It's like in small ways, small, right? Short, short sessions many times, short moments many times, in small ways to kind of regularly try to reconnect to our goodness. And we do that by activating our compassion for others and by increasing our discernment, our wisdom, with things like, is this healthy doubt or unhealthy doubt? Is this a negativity or a positivity? Is this making me f more connected towards the Dharma or less connected towards the Dharma? So that becomes how we grow, this wisdom. And then in the end, or towards the end, then like as our practice stabilizes, or we do things little by little, like with some regularity, little by little. So it's not just some big burden we feel bad we couldn't get to again. But it has to be at a pace with our own life, our own mind where we actually can do it. Little by little, we'll connect to that dignity and have that confidence and courage kind of awaken more in our experience. And then as it is always with these sessions, like I'm a totally lost, wandering, deluded, guilt-ridden, sentient being, like, but there are noble ones in the world. Like Kemba Seon Don Yorubache. Like, there's so many masters. There's so many noble beings. And take the time to learn from them, to be in their presence, to sincerely, like, kind of develop a, a relationship that's like, um, you know, where they get to know you some. And you get to know them better and cultivate that trust. And to actually be in the presence of some of these beings. Then they'll help us have more and more certainty, wisdom, or conviction that these aren't just ideas, they're not just beliefs that everyone's fundamentally good. But to actually taste that in your own experience, and little by little we do taste that. And then those tastes, those experiences start to get longer, and they start to permeate more of our experience, and we become more convinced that we're fundamentally good than that we're fundamentally bad. Our courage awakens based on our own practical lived experience. So we need to do whatever the supportive circumstances for our mind are with some nourishing, peaceful, encouraging love and also with some tough love, like if we have certain habits that we know are too overwhelming and they really shut us down and they activate kind of the most destructive parts of ourselves. We need to be more kind of courageous and strong about that and just to like really put some kind of strong lines around certain things we just won't do. It's too harmful, too harmful for ourselves or others. And that's part of having good, like, renunciation. So we need to also be really clear about that. And in the end, it all comes down to bodhicitta again and again. It really is what this whole path comes down to, this bodhicitta. And, like, I think as we, yeah, the further we go, I think, I mean, really, it's just, it's really the answer to all of our questions, bodhicitta. And it becomes something that we see in our own experience and by being around in the presence of noble ones and in good community, the Sangha, practicing kind of little by little the teachings of the Buddha, this bodhicitta really becomes, oh, this really is the sole panacea. This really is 
both the supreme healing as well as the completely unfabricated, natural, total pervasive naturalness of life. It can be that healing balm, and it also can just be that relaxed, at ease, spacious naturalness. It has both sutra and tantra. It really is kind of the what all these practices line up with. It's the root and the essence of all these practices. So thanks so much for just kind of letting me kind of care for this topic a little bit. Again, this is a it's a special topic in that I know, you know, the years go by. And for my own self and for others, this can, the heaviness of like having guilt or having things that, that happened to us before or like things that we bring from our life into the Dharma, which we can't help because we are ourselves and we engage the Dharma according to who we are, our humanness. Like, it's a real tenderness I have that as much as, much as we can to like really, how can we skillfully engage the Dharma? according to our own minds and our own hearts. And I really have a tenderness around that. Because, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to see myself fumbling with the same, kind of same challenge and the years go by and they just stack up, you know. It's like, oh, what can I do to like just be more skillful about this? And if you're kind of experiencing a similar thing, really genuinely like to have concern, con like love for yourself, like what can I do to not have this be the same problem 10 years from now? like to love yourself that much. They say that if you look at yourself in the future, like with some, as if like, um, kind of give yourself a lot of reasons about why you want to care for that future you. Oh, why are you going to save money for the future you? So you can, because you're worth it, you're valuable, you're going to have the, like you want this Buddha nature to come out more, you want the supportive conditions for you in the future to flourish, to connect more, to have more time for Dharma, more time to serve in the teachings. Like if you see this future you in a more kind of rosy light, more connecting to its goodness actually, it'll help you activate the steps that kind of lead towards that. Instead of just, oh, it's me now and I'm going to put what is happening today always in the front. And then just think what it would be like if we thought of everyone like that. Buddha is, Buddha's teaching is so profound. It's trying to orient towards the future. Use now to make the future better for all beings. And then it gives this long list of reasons why all beings are so valuable and why oneself is so valuable. This is like such a profound set of psychotechnologies that we can taste in simple ways right now in our experience. So really use whatever lines up with your own mind, your own heart to do that. And step by step, we're in this together. There's no way out. So let's like make it really nice for each other. Okay? It's, all, it's really all good. I'm really glad we get to be in this together forever because we're all really good. So yeah, thank you. Sending love. Then we'll do this practice together. This is Dujum Teresar Nundro practice. We'll do just a silent seat here quietly, and then we'll begin with this prayer, calling the Lama from afar. By His Holiness Dujan Rinpoche. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I thought I'd just really f quick few little kind of closing things. One, in terms of kind of lightening up one's practice. I think a good support I found is if there's certain prayers that otherwise might be kind of intimidating, like they're so glorious and resplendent and at ease <laughs> and just somewhat over, like otherworldly or so beyond, to like just pick one and read it really slowly and just let yourself be with it. Kind of like at, read a line and just kind of pause, then read a line, pause. And kind of let your mind, kind of the space of your attention, of your awareness, just kind of be with it as you read it, instead of just kind of trying to charge through it. But just really take your time and just kind of give yourself the space to kind of like resonate with the prayer, the meaning. And then secondly, in Vajrayana practice, um, one point that I found really helpful is that so much of the, like a mantra recitation, for example, is said to be self-reciting. So it's almost like instead of, it's instead of like 
because we're practicing and meditating, it produces the result of this mantra happening. Instead of that, it's actually like we like turn the corner of a room and we like look in some other thing happening and like the party's already going and we just didn't see it before. Or it's like a the channel of the TV is already kind of streaming along in the in the air and we just tune into it being there. So it takes off the sense of there being like I have to do all this work to produce this amazing thing, like a mantra or a visualization. And instead it's just it's like the self resounding sound of the nature, or the self resounding expression or form of the nature of one's goodness. It's almost just like you show up and kind of can't believe it, like this sense of awe of like, wow, this is happening, how, how wonderful. And to kind of like hold the practice a little more in that kind of a space, that's really technically how they say like the specific instructions around that with Vajrayana. And thirdly, if there's something that kind of it's a habitual hang up that your mind keeps looping back into, kind of a negative story or some kind of a something that like really keeps kind of like closing you up and shutting you down. So I'd say part of, like one thing I found helpful is um, when we do a practice session, however long it is, that when we get to the dedication of the merit, that we really think of that specific kind of imbalance or that mistake we made. And we specifically also dedicate that positive virtue to bring resolution to that specific imbalance. To, if we harm someone, for example, in the past, to really dedicate specifically, intentionally, think of like sending the virtue of the practice you just did to heal that, to help that person, to resolve that conflict. And so, like, we can do that from a distance and quietly. We don't have to say anything about it to anyone else. So, we don't have to, we can prevent any f other conflict or something from arising, but really, like, as an offering, like, as a way of kind of, kind of forgiving the situation, forgiving oneself forgiving, kind of making amends, and like so we can move on in our practice, but do it with a sense of kindness and like love and care for that being too, or that situation too, like kind of to care for ourselves enough to try to resolve that so we can kind of let our compassion and wisdom and love kind of shine out more brightly. So there are a few little thoughts. Thank you, friends, so much. Thank you very much.